Greetings all and welcome to another Tuesday Talk. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the English article system, the determiners uh, in, uh, in the English language and how we as second language teachers can uh, teach this stuff. Now obviously we need to know it before we can teach it, so we're going to take a gander into learning some more about what the article is. We'll look at the form, the meaning, and the use of articles today. Those are the three main areas that we're going to be looking at. Please bear in mind, this is just a snapshot of what you can learn regarding articles. <clears throat> um, obviously, you can read textbooks like the one that I'm using primarily for this uh, mini lecture series, which is the grammar book. Um, by uh, Cels Mercia Larson Freeman, but there are many other things out there and many other uh, examples and ideas that you can use for teaching um, articles to your students. Let's jump right into the form of articles. A little introduction here, I guess, before we do that. Why are articles difficult for second language learners? And by the way, uh, just to let you know, some of your students will, will master the majority of grammar. They will master uh, a lot of vocabulary. They, they, they may, some of your very good students are going to go up four or 5,000 words in vocabulary. Um, they're going to appear in all ways nearly native, but they're going to have most difficulty mastering um, articles. Um, Ellie Hinkle, I was fortunate enough to be in one of her presentations uh, at a TESOL convention, and she talked about the importance of uh, vocabulary building for uh, students who are learning to write. She happened to be at a TESOL convention, uh, but she was mentioning that this could be applied to anyone who is learning uh, language first or second. She mentioned that she is uh, Russian by birth and that she came to this country when she was about 16. She's a PhD. She's an accomplished speaker, writer, teacher, and publisher. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, he was not a publisher, a writer. And she's done so many things. She still has problems with articles. So this is one area that's very difficult to master. Um, <laughs> great lady. I uh, encourage you to get some of her books or at least listen to her. She's a, a wonderful teacher and, um, uh, well, she's a good leader in this, in this field of, of study. All right. Why are there, they have difficulties with them? Well, one is that some of the, the other languages don't actually use articles. Like we use articles, they use other things to signify, you know, something specific or something general or referent. Um, and they may use things like um, um, morphemes, uh, things that you put at the beginning or an end of a particular word or group of words to signify um, an article. Um, additionally, the process that we have, the system that we have, uh, has a has a historical background to it, and so there are a lot of things that kind of came in in different ways and because that history is not a smooth transition we have a hodgepodge of rules and words and phrases and and it's still not even set in stone um, if you go to another english-speaking country like uh, like england or australia <clears throat> you'll find the use of articles will be slightly different there uh, and i'll show you one of those uh, as an example as i move on actually it's one that i've acquired and people look at me when i when i use it Another reason why uh, it's difficult to master is because articles perform many functions. Um, they're not only uh, providing a, a marker to say this is a, a, a determined uh, noun, but it's giving things like specificity or it's being general or it's, uh, uh, it's being used to differentiate one group from another. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons that students are going to have to grapple with because it's a multifaceted uh, system. Uh, also, uh, articles function differently with different words, and we'll look at that in a little bit as well uh, with the examples of few and a few and, and how it changes the meaning of that word simply by adding the article. Uh, many of the rules are not explicitly known even to uh, we uh, native speakers. Um, I remember re reviewing a book that was called The Article Book, and I forget who, who wrote it, but there were like a hundred rules in the book for the use of articles. Uh, we don't know those hundred rules and we probably can't explain it unless we spend some time studying it, which is why you're watching this video and I'm producing it so that we can learn a little more and be ready when our students have questions. <clears throat> All right, this is a general breakdown of uh, the form of the article. First thing that I want to show you is that there are some pronunciation differences for these words. We have the and the. And this is just pronunciation here. This isn't actually the way you would spell it, but you would say, for example, the apple or the apple. Um, the balloon, right? 
You wouldn't say the elephant, you'd probably say the elephant, right? So we've got that. You also have the shortened form here of the, um, uh, I, I actually have difficulty saying it would be like the, and you have a stop or a, in, at the back. You also have different pronunciations for the A, right? A ball, a, um, a window, you wouldn't say a window, it would be a little more difficult to say. Uh, so you've got a uh, and a. Of course, an is basically not going to change, but you have pronunciation differences, even though it's spelled the same way. You also have a classification structure for articles. So we've got a pronunciation difference that we should know and be able to teach. And what are the rules for when you use the and when you use the? Um, and there are a number of them. Hopefully, we'll run across a couple of them uh, during this lecture. Let's look at the classifications. We have two basic kinds. We have common and proper. <coughs> And proper is just singular and plural, but within common, we also have another breakdown of count and non-count. We have count words, okay, words that are countable, right, like tables and chairs and, and windows. And we have non-count, things like furniture and uh, water, you know, one water, two water, no, right. Uh, um, we have, um, um, you know, uh, you don't have an ounce of love, you don't have two love, Right? And, and uh, for trust, those are things you just don't count. Right, We also have another breakdown of definite and indefinite. Okay, um, And we use the definite for certain things. We use the indefinite for certain things. Definite is more specific. Um, it's more uh, understood by all the parties involved, um, generally speaking. And so you have the in, in that sense. And for the indefinite, you have a, an, or some, or nothing. Um, so that's the breakdown, and that's the breakdown that your students are going to need to know. Obviously, this is all in structural format, and it's boring, and it's going to be harder to understand. You need to put examples into this, which I hope we're going to do. Let's take a look at some more of the classifications, take a little deeper look at uh, this whole idea of count and non-count. The concept of count and non-count is actually an arbitrary uh, creation. It just sort of emerged out of language use. There are some things that we count, and there are some things that we don't count. You have generic, general ideas, but sometimes we break the rules with them as well. So it's an arbitrary set of words that native speakers choose to not count. Um, other languages, it'll be the same word, but they count them, and, and uh, native English speakers don't. Um, there's no rhyme or reason, although there are some generalities. We generally don't count things that are really tiny, uh, things that don't have a specific shape, uh, things that are an, amalgama an amalgamation of a variety of things, you know, like transportation is, you know, cars, bikes, uh, planes, trains, and, and automobiles types of thing. You put that all together, that's transportation. Well, we kind of difficult to count that, so that's another thing that we don't count. But, okay, in any event, things that we count, uh, right, well, things that are countable. We can actually identify them, typically counted items, right? Trees, dogs, rats, and boys, I can count them all. Uh, right? Two trees, four dogs, six rats, and one boy. I can count all of them, so they're countable. Non-count. These are uncountable items. They're typically not counted, right? we got liquids, right? Grouped items, furniture, traffic, formless items, right? Gas, bacon. I thought that was amazing, by the way. We don't count bacon. I'll have two bacon, please. Two bacons, please. No, two pieces of bacon. Two strips of bacon. We count pieces. We count strips. But we don't count two bacons, right? Someone says, hey, you got any bacon? Right? Yeah. Okay. When we say, where's the bacon? We're talking about this big glob of stuff, right? That's stuff that I know it and you know it, and therefore we call it the bacon. But normally, we, you know, I have bacon. Do you have bacon? Okay. Okay. That type of thing. Interesting, I thought. Ideas, also things that are not countable. Okay. Some words can also be both. Probably a different meaning. So, for example, life is beautiful. Okay. Uh, that would be life. Well, I can also say a life is all we have, right? We only have one life. One life is all we have. A life is not worth living. A life. I can use life and a life. Now, probably a little different between them. Life being general and a life being a specific person's life, right? He knows the truth, okay? The truth. And he is truth. And here we're probably looking at two different things. One, the second one being more of a generic uh, thing that actually typifies who he is. He is truth. In this case, it would probably be 
uh, God, or he knows the truth. It's a specific truth that we're referring to, not, not a more of in a generic sense, right? Another example. She walks in beauty like the night. That's a poet. I don't know who wrote it. Somebody knows. Please let me know because I forget what it is. She walks in beauty. Well, in beauty. Beauty is a noun, but there's no... There's no article there, right? The beauty in her eyes. Well, now I have one, right? Um, so this can be both. And this probably means the same thing in this sense, right? Why can we do it in one place and not in the other? I don't know. Um, another way that we can break down this whole idea of count and non-count is when we look at things like mass that are formless, right? Um, like, for example, gold. When you find gold in the ground, you don't say, I found a gold, or I found the gold, or I found two gold. You find gold. It's formless. It's got no particular shape. It just has a kind of a mass, right? Those don't normally have an article, right? So, for example, I have some iron. I found some iron. It's a generic non-count type of thing, right? I don't have one iron. I don't have two iron. I got two pounds of iron. I can count pounds, not ounces, right? But look what I do with this. I have some iron. I will take the iron, which I find interesting. Well, what iron? Well, the is now referring back here to this iron. The some iron that I can't count, but now I use a definite article because I'm referring back. I will make an iron for my wife. Well, I'm using the same word iron, but it's not the same meaning of iron. Now I'm talking about one of these things, you know, that you use to make your shirts nice and smooth. But I went from non-count non to uh, specific, because I'm referring back to one, to back to an actual countable iron uh, thing. I, uh, one iron, two irons. We can count these irons. Same word, different definitions, therefore different articles that go with it. <clears throat> can be confusing, right? For a student trying to learn, well, when do I use the and when don't I use the? Let's run into proper nouns. Uh, proper nouns, as you know, are like things like proper names or geographical locations. Uh, and they nearly always have uh, no articles, right? So, for example, David. We don't say the David unless, of course, we're referring to the David sculpture that uh, Michelangelo created. Uh, I think it was Michelangelo. Yeah, it was Michelangelo, right? Or Mount Rushmore. We don't say the Mount Rushmore, right? We don't say the Africa or the China. We do say the White House, but that's because the name of the White House happens to be the White House. That's its name, okay? Um, so it's included within the name, therefore we say it. But uh, generally speaking, proper nouns, no articles whatsoever. We also use articles when... I'm sorry, we do use articles with proper nouns when we're trying to identify a specific one out of many. If I have a room full of Michaels, right, and I say, Michael is my brother, but there are six Michaels in the room, well, then I might say, well, you know, the Michael with the red hat over there, that Michael, the Michael with the red hat, right? He, he's, my, he's my brother, okay? Now I can use that because I'm trying to, to specify one out of many. Okay, that's well, that would actually be legal. Also, company names have uh, taken on ownership and have become, uh, not taken on ownership, have become generic in the sense. Kleenex, which is one that I continue to use, and people tell me, that's not a Kleenex, it's a tissue. Uh, so I'll ask for a Kleenex instead of a tissue. Kleenex is a company. If I'm talking about the company, I wouldn't say, oh, look, there's a Kleenex. No, I would say, there's Kleenex, the company. Um, but we've made it a generic Thing, and therefore we add thing we add an ah to it, right? Coke, and I'm not sure if this actually works. Actually, Coke is short for Coca-Cola, um, but you can go to places in America and they will, and you can say to them, "Can I have a Coke?" And then they will say, "Yeah, what kind do you want?" Right? Oh, I'll take a Mountain Dew, or I'll take a Seven Up, or I'll take a you know an orange slice, um, or I'll take a Pepsi, you know. But it's still a Coke. It's a generic thing. Um, or even when we're asking for a drink, you know, uh, we, we, get, we order, we want a Coca-Cola, even though that's the name of the company, right? All right, sometimes they can be both proper and generic. So Earth, for example, Earth is where I live, and I live on the Earth, okay? Both of those are legal. Both of those uh, work with the English language. Um, I could probably even say I live on Earth, right? Either one is going to be okay, and either one is legal. Again, how do you teach this to your, to your students? Syntax of, uh, of an article. Usually it is the first part of a noun phrase. Um, noun phrase, you know, the big blue, the big blue uh, window. Um, 
um, a sleep, uh, not a sleep, um, uh, a slipper in the room, right? But sometimes you have, um, what do they call it, a predeterminer in front of it, like all, all the boys, right? Half the red balloons, um, half a minute to wait, uh, feed the dog twice a day, right? Two times a day, twice a day. And so the syntax is usually that the, the uh, determiner, the article is first within a noun phrase. Uh, sometimes there may be something in front of it, a predeterminer, and there may be any number of adjectives after it, right? Um, the big red, red and yellow slimy, the big red and yellow, the big slimy red and yellow dog. I guess I would do it that way, right? If I want to put it in the proper order. But I've got uh, some in before, or some in front, some afterwards, okay? We also have issues with syntax regarding, look at how this is changing. If someone says to you, can I, can I talk to you? And you can say, um, yeah, I have a few minutes. That's positive. I have a few minutes. Or I can say to you, uh, yeah, I have few minutes. I don't have a lot of time here. N a no article in this sense means that it's a negative. I have few minutes. I have a few minutes. Right? Um, or I could say the same thing again regarding time. You know, do you, have a do you have some time? I have little time. I do not have a lot of time. That's what it means, right? But we say I have little time. No marker, right? If I add a marker, now it's a positive. Do you have time? Yeah, I have a little time. I have a little time. That's a positive, right? All because we add or don't add a marker uh, using things like few and little or a few and a little. So the syntax that's set up is actually changing a lot more. It's not giving you specificity or, gen or general, right? It's giving you a positive or a negative in addition to uh, specificity in general. Okay. Let's take a look at the meaning of uh, some of these articles. Ugh. Articles can provide you with information that something is generic or something is specific. Um, for example, a dog is a fun and useful pet. Being generic, a dog, well, you know, a particular, no special thing, right? I could say the dog is a fun and useful pet. Now I'm referring to something specific. The dog that we own, or the dog that you own, or the dog that we are talking about, right? A dog and the dog, right? And also, we can look at it verse in the element of I know and you know. If I say, I have a car. Well, as I'm saying this, I know about the car, but you don't. So I say, I have a car. And then the next sentence, I say, the car is red. Well, why do I say the car? I'm referring back to the car that I said before. More importantly, I now know of the car, and you know of the car. So I can say the car. We both know who we are referring to, right? Uh, this one I thought was interesting, and this was out of the grammar book uh, example, which I thought was very good. Never thought of this before. I bought a book and spoke to the author. Now, I should be saying a an author, but I know who the author is because it's implied in a book. I have to go back to that previous noun, and I say, oh, I bought a book. Oh, the book of the, the author of that book. Uh, so I can look at it that way. It's rather interesting. We can talk about nonspecific, right? He needs a bath. Not the bath, right? Not a particular bath, right? We need a break. Not a specific break, just a generic break, right? I want a cookie. I'm not really particular right now about which one. I just, I want a, a cookie, right? Now, if I see the plate of cookies and I find the one that's got the most, you know, chocolate chips in it, and maybe I'll say, I want that cookie, right? Or if there's only one left and I say, I want the cookie, okay, that would be different. But generally, it's just generic. It's nonspecific, right? There's also specific, right? He was hungry, so he took, he took it. Oh, that doesn't make sense. He was hungry, so he took some. Okay, he took some, meaning that there are more there, right? He took one. He took it. Um, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, we have zero articles. Okay, and zero articles are basically articles that we don't say. And this is one of the ones that I've actually acquired. Two types of generic articles. We've, uh, or we've two types of zero articles. The one type is a generic non-count plural. So, for example, I have milk. Right? Do you have milk? That's a generic non-count. Um, or do you have eggs? I'm not referring to specific eggs, but just do you have eggs? Right? Although we count eggs. Right? So we can we can count eggs. One eggs, two eggs, three eggs, yeah. We also have null articles, right? So for example, you could say they ate chicken. What did you have for lunch? Oh, we had chicken. Okay. Um, 
That, that would be this non-count. I might say he ate a chicken. I'm referring to a whole chicken, right? A chicken. Uh, he sells cars. Okay, that's general. He sells the cars. In other words, that's his job selling the cars, and then somebody else is doing something else in the company, right? He sells the cars. You know, he does the maintenance, you know, doing that, something like that, right? Uh, but you put in the article and you change the meaning of it, right? Uh, a marriage is a blessing. Or marriage is a blessing. Okay, and there's going to be a slight difference there, right? They took him to the hospital. They took him to hospital. And I don't even know if they use took him to hospital, but in, in some English-speaking countries, they will say, he's in hospital, right? Somebody is in hospital. Not in the hospital, but in hospital. That's, a, that's what um, the, this textbook will say is a, is a zero article. It's a null article. Uh, they simply omit it for certain words, like in hospital or in, in school. We do that here, right? He's in school. He's not in the school. He's in school, right? She enjoys the beauty in fall, right? She enjoys the beauty in the fall. Okay, well, probably say either one, but I can get away with saying she enjoys the beauty in fall. Um, so here we have articles that we get rid of for certain things, right? Like school is the better example, right? Um, they took him to school. Uh, he's in hospital. We pull it out and it's okay. It's a zero article. It belongs there, but for some reason, for certain words, we decided that we don't need it there. We don't put it there. Uh, um, the textbook also mentions the some of the historical research uh, related to uh, the use of articles by a number of linguists. Uh, most notably would be Halliday. Uh, and he and others have talked about um, using articles and these certain patterns that you can uh, used to sh identify what they are. And so, for example, we have the, and then a singular noun, the window, or a window, or the balloons, right? Or balloons, right? Or I could even say the balloons if I'm referring to them as a group, right? Um, or a non-count, right? We can, uh, eat water, for example. Okay, and so here are these different patterns that you can use to try to identify what is proper when you're, when you're using them. Um, I found a little use of them. I think that these ideas, you know, the general specific, the I know you know um, ideas are going to be more useful for uh, teaching. Here are some other uses for uh, articles, and these are topic specific. For example, we have body parts. We talk about the heart, the liver, the ears, the eyes, and we give us an article for these. We don't, we don't say a heart or a liver, right? It's begun. It's I know and you know. Okay, where are the ears? I know what you, we're talking about here, right? Diseases. I thought it was rather interesting because there are some diseases I would consider similar, but we have different articles for them. I mean, we have a cold, okay, a cold, but we have the flu. Okay, why do we do that? Does that make sense to you? Because a cold means to me, okay, one of many. I don't have a specific cold. I have a cold. But the flu. I have the flu. Well, there's probably lots of different kinds of flus. That's why every year they come out with new flu vaccine. You know, you get your flu shot. Uh, because there are many different kinds. But when we use it, we talk about it, we talk about the flu and a headache. We have the mumps, okay, that I can understand. We have a headache, that makes sense, one of many. We have pneumonia, non-count. Why? Don't know. Uh, you know, he has cancer. Uh, something is ringing in my head that in the, in the movie Forrest Gump, uh, Forrest says that his mother, she died of the cancer. Or she got the cancer. And she, he puts the word the right here. Uh, when he's speaking about it. I don't know whether that's a southern thing or whether it was just out of the movie, but I thought it was interesting because he, in a sense, in, breaks my rule because cancer is something that you don't add an article to. Uh, but he did, right? So diseases. Um, okay, geographic names, things like Asia, Japan, New York, Nyack, Lake Titicaca, none of those are going to have articles, right? Um, in, in their proper name forms. Inventions, which I think is interesting. Here we use articles. We talk on the phone. Um, and this is the phone and this idea, I think, would just be uh, an idea that everybody understands. The phone. Get the door. Everybody knows what the door means, right? And get on the train. So there are some generic concepts or ideas that we have in our head. And since I know it and you know it, we, we add a the to it. Known places, similar thing. Oh, where did mom go? She went to the bank. You know, she might have 
accounts in 15 different banks, but I could still say she went to the bank. Now I understand that, and that's legal. Going to the store, right? The uses of articles. Uh, you look at all these and you're like, okay, how in the world are you going to teach all these? There are different rules for a lot of things all over the place. I would begin by uh, looking at some of the similarities that you can use over and over again. Uh, all this to say, articles are very complex and they're difficult to explain in their entirety, but 2Z pointillism is going to work here. Remember, 2Z pointillism is this idea is where I can teach certain things and there are other things that I'm not going to be able to teach very well. But what I can teach, I should teach, and what I can't teach, I should let um, osmosis take effect and uh, let them pick it up as they interact and, and um, develop their language fluency. They're going to pick up those things. Lots more can be studied uh, in this area, and uh, a lot more can be taught, so we want to be able to look at both. When you're going to be teaching, I would definitely want you to look at things like I know you know, general and specific. Um, large and small, count and non-count. Uh, those are the things that you're going to be looking at. Now, just to let you know, there are a number of places online where you can go and find stuff. Uh, just a, just this is just a simple search for a Google search here and you'll see there's a whole bunch of different places that are listed here some of these are uh, for ESL that I found some of them weren't so for example here's Purdue's uh, owl and they have directions for how to use articles uh, here's another one uh, which looks Danish um, grammar girl and this is probably more geared for uh, ESL or younger learners and how to learn how to do these. Bear in mind, this is a lot of text, and I think this is going to be more difficult for ESL. But you also have, uh, this looks like ESL, although uh, here's one, right? Uh, oh, this is editing and proofreading. Again, this is for, for native speakers again. Here's Dave's uh, ESL Cafe, and uh, he's got a game here called Jeopardy. And here we talk about how to teach them um, articles using a game. Now, obviously, you can go back and you can teach you know, uh, some of these rules, you know, I know, you know, general specific, you can talk about proper nouns or count nouns, you can do those things. But then you can play a game and you've got, you know, um, words in it, you know, she ate blank bread. And you got to put in one of the right answers, right? She ate the bread or some bread or his bread or a lot. You got to fill in something, right? That's just the, the game. And then they play the game and they practice with their articles and hopefully they're going to learn those rules. I teach the rules first, right? Here's another place that's uh, Dave's ESL Cafe, and here are some examples uh, that they're showing you. Okay, there are lots of places online where you can go and see places, see examples, see uh, activities, uh, instructions, articles. You want to start off very early in the instruction process when you're dealing with even a pre-beginner or a beginner. Um, you may not, not be teaching the actual rules, but you want to start getting them involved in using articles, um, even if it's if it's in more of a, a rote uh, type of um, means. But eventually, you want to dig them, drill them down into knowing what some of these rules are, just in there generically, you know, like I know you know type of thing, just to help them understand what's going on. Uh, articles, as I say, are very complex, and there are a lot of things involved with them. We don't understand adequately how to explain them all. Um, and they're still, they're still changing, in my opinion. They're still morphing. So um, one of the more difficult areas, please bear this in mind as you're trying to figure out ways to teach articles to your students. If you do have any questions, I'll be glad to uh, answer them. Just catch me online or um, in an email. Bye-bye now.